welcome everybody to our town hall meeting. Um, we are attempting to get our ASL interpreter on and so when she shows up, Emily Parks will be our interpreter for and we just thank her for supporting today's events. Um, so hopefully she'll, oh, there she is. All right, thank you, Emily, for joining us and being a part or helping us out with this event. Today, I'm joined by Chief of Schools and Continuous Improvement, um, Wyeth Jesse, Chief of Human Resources, Clover Cod, and Executive Director of Special Education, Patricia Campbell, to share updates and to answer questions around planning for a return to in-person instruction. First and foremost, Seattle Public Schools is committed to the health and safety of our students and staff. Last week, I sent a letter to Governor Jay Inslee, Dr. Umar Shah, Washington Secretary of Health, and Dr. Jeffrey Dushan, Health Officer for the Public Health, Seattle and King County, to advocate for January vaccination of educators and all school-based staff that will be supporting the increase to in-person learning. It's really important that we um, make that uh, a top priority in order to keep our staff, students, and communities physically safe, as well as mentally and academically healthy. Prioritizing vaccinations for public educators and critical support staff will send a strong message to the state's commitment to public education and care for our public educators in a time when so much is uncertain. We'll continue that advocacy and we'll continue to advocate on behalf of our staff as we begin planning for a return to school buildings on March 1st for pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade students and students being served in special education intensive service pathways. Last week, families of these selected students were asked to complete a survey to let us know if their student would return to in-person or if they wish to stay remote. I know um, that this is a very incredibly difficult decision especially as the context and information around COVID-19 is constantly changing. Many families reached out to let us know that they needed more time to make this decision and we heard you. That deadline has now been extended to Wednesday, tomorrow, January 13th. You also let us know that families needed a process to request adjustments as circumstances change. Um, we listened and we'll put an appeal process in place as well. Um, some, of our, uh, some of our families also expressed frustration that we can't share more details around what a return to school buildings will look like. So I hope that today we can begin to answer your questions and shed some light on all of the planning that's been happening at Seattle Public Schools. Please know that in all of this planning, we will continue to follow the guidance of public health, listen to our community, and make necessary changes to meet the needs of our students, families, and staff throughout our planning. However, there may be questions that we cannot answer yet, and I want to be as transparent as possible about that. This is a constantly changing situation, um, but one that um, we're continuing to move forward on. So it's important for our students. In order to finalize many of our plans, we need to know each family's decision as soon as possible. Um, and that's why we did the survey. Parallel to the family survey, our human resources team is also running a survey for staff. This information will allow us to match staff and students um, because we have to make sure that we have a one to 15 or less ratio. We have to create new school level master schedules. We have to lift up new bus routes. Um, we have to create in-person lunch services and all the things that, and there's just so much more that needs to be put into place. Um, and we need to do this all while continuing to maintain regular operations for remote learning, special education, childcare, and serving 30,000 meals a day. None of the in-person plans can be finalized until we know how many students intend to return to school buildings. That's why that survey is so important to our planning. Until we know the number of students we need to prepare for in our buildings, our plan is just a plan. Once we know the number of students choosing to return to our buildings, our plan can be put into motion. This planning has never stopped. We have actually been planning this return since last spring. 
Staff have been working hard to put a plan in place responsive to feedback from our June engagement teams that included educators, students, school leaders, parents, staff, and the board. Together with our labor partner, the Seattle Education Association, through the already negotiated SCA SPS health and safety team, we have created strong protocols and most recently in collaboration with health and safety experts, we have redesigned and made improvements to our learning spaces. We worked with um, five architectural firms to create cohort zones across our schools with separate in entrances, exits, and bathrooms to increase safety. Um, plexiglass partitions have been placed in the front office and in specialized classrooms. Our facilities and operations team worked with the Washington Economic Recovery Coalition to implement an extensive COVID-19 heating, ventilation, and air conditioning risk assessment based on best practices identified by public health and HVAC experts. We're providing staff and students safe learning environments by increasing natural ventilation and optimi optimizing filtration. Individual classrooms have also been redesigned, ensuring six feet between students and a minimum of 10 feet in the front of the class for the teacher. We are committed to the health and safety of our students and staff, and I'm personally committed to advocating on their behalf. I'll now pass it over to our Chief of Human Resources, Clover Cod, who can share more about our staffing and bargaining efforts. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Clover Cod, the Chief of Human Resource. Um, we are uh, beginning our bargaining conversations with the leadership in the Seattle Education Association. The district will be sharing our proposals with SEA this Friday, and those uh, negotiations are going to be underway. We have also lifted up a bargaining website on the front page. If you go to the Seattle Public Schools webpage, we will have a button on there that will have bargaining updates so we can keep you all informed on how that's going. We did share with SEA that our hopes are to be completed with bargaining by um, before the middle of February so that we have enough time to be able to let our families and our staff know um, all of that. Um, the details that are within what will be an addendum to the memorandum of understanding that we've got in place right now. In order to meet the social distancing guidelines in the classroom, we will be negotiating a lower class size for the pre-K through first grade and even in special ed pathways classrooms so that we are able to meet the six feet of distancing between students this will result in likely a one uh, teacher to 15 student ratio. And so that is what we will be working on with SEA, working out those details during negotiations. Um, we've had a lot of questions about whether or not we will require the vaccine for educators. That is not our stance at the moment, um, but we are advocating that educators be prioritized for the vaccine um, as Superintendent Juno has um, made that public. At this time, I am going to turn it over to Wyeth Jesse, Chief of Schools and Continuous Improvement. Thank you. Thank you, Clover. Hi again, Wyeth Jesse, uh, Chief of Schools and Continuous Improvement, and I'll be covering a little bit of information around school operations, some of the steps that we have taken uh, up to this point, and then a general vision of what in-person services would look like for pre-K, K and one. So since last March, uh, we have developed health and safety protocols uh, with uh, the guidance from the Departments of Health as well as other state agencies. We've had timely updates uh, on those particular protocols um, with the different professionals here in the district working on them, which includes our experts in transportation, uh, as well as our HVAC systems, and uh, additionally, uh, our registered nurses uh, who've been working again really closely with departments of health um, and our local uh, area health experts, uh, including our hospitals. Um, so as we've gone along since last March, we've uh, updated uh, those particular protocols, rolled them out, provided guidance to our staff 
uh, all 8,000 plus. And then we've uh, posted the, the trainings. Uh, some are asynchronous, so it's through videos. Uh, and then we keep updating them and pushing out additional information uh, almost on a weekly basis uh, so they can get that uh, up-to-date information as we think about providing a safe and welcoming environment um, for our staff, our families, and our students. Additionally, uh, we are now um, providing some additional oversight. So we go out to all 104 of our schools to check in, answer questions for any staff that are on site, and to make sure that we are following the health and safety protocols such as social distancing, the wearing of masks, washing of our hands, sanitation uh, of, our, uh, air, of our different or common areas, um, and then just overall uh, ability for us to make sure that we have supervision or folks uh, when they are on site to uh, maintain uh, the six feet or more uh, when they are interacting with the public or each other. Uh, we also have specific uh, protocols for when we do have suspected cases of COVID-19 um, and so that we are able to uh, adaptly adapt and adjust to make sure that we address those issues as soon as possible uh, as we want to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19. As we switch and we have those uh, particular protocols in place, uh, which includes not only the health and safety protocols, but we have transportation protocols. We also have about how we're going to transition through different spaces. And we also think about attestation. Um, that when, if we were to think about the in-person services for our students uh, coming up here in March, uh, we would make sure that we have, uh, that we're centering ourselves around a cohort model. And that means that 15 or less students would be um, in a classroom and would uh, operate as they come onto campus in the classroom setting itself. And then uh, anytime they may go out for recess and then uh, leaving the campus at the end of the school day. So when we really think about visualizing this, you're like really thinking about how can this cohort operate in a bubble uh, so that they're not having uh, to mitigate the interactions with any other adults or students. Uh, so the day may look like you're going to get a station report or a health screening report electronically in an email or a text to the family member. They're going to answer a series of questions that we have uh, directed from the CDC. They're going to answer those and get those back to us before the school day starts. The office takes that information in. Obviously, any flags for uh, folks who attest that they are possibly at risk or demonstrating symptoms related to COVID-19. And then we would follow up on a phone call or conversation with those particular instances. But if they get the green light and their attestation is successful, they come on site, we know where that's at. And then as the students come on board, we want to match uh, who's attested uh, as well as um, who did not. Um, we can work with those. We have a special process for uh, having uh, contact the family member to finish the attestation if it wasn't completed before coming onto campus. And then really just having specific locations. So when the bus drops off, our buses are sanitized every day. The seating arrangement is to provide uh, social distancing, masking, even specific steps about how to exit and enter the bus. So they come on, we're moving it with those kids who walked onto campus and safely locating them and getting them inside the classroom, where again, they're working in this cohort model, uh, so they're separated from others. And then the rest of the day uh, is really about specific locations and times in which that cohort would operate to go to the restroom or to get a recess, or they would receive their lunches because they're gonna be eating in their classrooms so that other cohorts don't come into contact with them. The day would operate that way with their teacher, helping supporting their students and their learning and their socialization, which is one of the true benefits of in-person services. And then uh, summarizing and closing up uh, any of our day to uh, go ahead and release the students uh, back out. And so they um, obviously would get home either by uh, walking or uh, through the bus. So those are the major pieces of what it would look like again for in-person services, something that we're excited about here um, as we plan forward um, as 
Superintendent Janot mentioned there'll be many more details. Uh, things will change uh, because there will be additional guidance and steps that we'll have to do to pivot, uh, but we'll make sure that that information is on our website. So uh, now I'll have Executive Director Trish Campbell um, with Special Education uh, be the next person. Hi there, thank you. This is Trish Campbell, Executive Director of Special Education. Um, glad to be able to share some information with you. Um, so when determining the needs of our students with IEPs, um, consideration was given to students with, whose disabilities call for in-person services. So this, the following service pathways, um, focus, distinct, social emotional learners, moderate intensive, medically fragile, and our students who have already been through the current process for receiving in-person services as determined by their IEP teams will continue to be served in person. So if you are in uncertain as to what service pathway your student receives instruction within, um, you can reach out to your student's case manager, special education teacher, and they can um, let you know what, the, um, what service pathway your student is receiving services in. So um, these students, um, rep the students in these service pathways represent um, students who may have a greater need for in-person services. Um, we would like to acknowledge that students have, have been having a varying degree of experiences, different experiences with remote learning. Some students have, um, um, remote learning has been a struggle. And for other students, they found success in the established routines with their dedicated educators. Um, so if your student is not served in one of the service pathways that is designated to return, and you believe that your student requires in-person services, um, we will continue the IEP process for making those decisions. Um, so please reach out to your student's case manager or special education teacher. So um, as also if, as um, student, as, sorry, as Superintendent Juno explained, there are multiple variables still at play in determining the details of what school will look like for our students. What we can say confidently is that students who return on May 1st for in-person schooling will receive their special education services and teams will continue to support students in making progress on IEP goals remotely and in person. Thank you. Thanks everybody uh, for that good information. And you know, this is also recorded and so I would encourage those who maybe joined us late to go back and review at the beginning um, some of the information about reopening. We do have some questions that we can get through really quickly and as always, um, you know, we will continue to sort through the questions. We, as you heard, we have a frequently asked questions um, on our website. We are lifting a bargaining um, website as well so we can keep you updated on what those negotiations with our labor union looks like too. Um, so I guess the first question um, can really be, I know uh, why if you went a little bit through it, but maybe you can just say again, what does a socially distanced first grade classroom look like? And then a follow up to that is just how are we planning for the open concept schools? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Superintendent Janot. Um, we would have uh, desks six feet apart, so we literally go in and measure the, di the distance between desks. Um, and then we want to make sure also the pathways are open. Um, and the last step uh, around that would really be about how the other furniture, uh, including the teacher's workstation, be located in that classroom so that we can maintain the distance and allowing easy uh, access for students in and out. We don't want to jam them up. Uh, what it does, doesn't mean is that um, we'll be sitting in uh, really close proximity on the floor for having students in circle time. So that's one of the things that we're going to have to give up. Uh, but the good news is students are sitting forward, you know, facing the teacher, uh, being socially distanced one another, um, and so that we can help maintain the health and safety protocols. And then about um, open concept buildings it is really about airflow and the number of people that can be in a defined space. So we have experts in this particular area that have examined um, the flow of air and the number of uh, people who would sit in those particular areas. And so we would be following all the, the regulations that come straight from the CDC uh, and would be doing that. Um, you know, and so larger spaces, as you know, anywhere from uh, grocery stores to 
airports, you know, also have large spaces and airflow, so it would work in a, a similar manner. Okay, great. Um, I know a big question out there, and there, it's always concerns when we have to shift staff around a bit to, um, you know, during budget times and all of those times. And this is yet another instance where there may be some um, staffing shifts. And so I don't know, Clover or Wyeth, if you want to sort of talk about uh, just sort of like the bigger plan, like we need again to know how many students are returning, how many staff are coming in and why there may be a need for um, a different teacher for a student. Wyeth, do you want me to uh, start and you can tag along if you want to? Um, so because the class sizes have to be so low, that sort of one to 15 on average ratio, uh, we know that in order to get our students back in person, that is going to require some shifting um, in our primary classrooms. We are going to, um, at least our proposal will be that we use um, some of our ELL and intervention staff to be able to help lower that classroom ratio. And we um, do not intend on moving students in that sort of second through fifth grade will mean will stay remote they'll stay with their classroom teacher but we do anticipate some shifts so as you know some students will still remain remote and some staff will be requesting remote accommodations due to being immunocompromised themselves there are reasons um, that are outlined in the cdc guidelines for which staff can ask for those remote accommodations so it really starts to become a mix and match of who's actually coming back in person for the students and then who it, uh, do we have as staff who are able to come back in person as well. Wyatt, did you want to add anything on to that? No, I, I, I think the key theme there is really recognizing that um, all these efforts are going to take a lot of, of flexibility if, if we're really looking to uh, have students in person in an unprecedented time. We really have to think about what are the needs of our students and our families coupled with the staff? Uh, staff have uh, their own um, health and safety to worry about. We That is paramount for us as well. And so um, we'll just be looking at what the schedules look like uh, for our staff and then um, making sure that we're also upholding in-person services, which hopefully doesn't get lost in this conversation as well um, for those families who elect to um, continue with that um, in-person or at their particular home uh, for those services. All right, thanks. Um, Trish, do you want that? There's a question about medi medically fragile students and what sort of extra precautions might be taken um, for that return to in-person. Sure. Um, so our students who are receiving services in the uh, medically fragile service pathway um, definitely have unique needs and may be at higher risk for um, many different types of things. So we are working closely with health services and with families. We'll be making individual plans for services and um, making sure that families and staff have all the training and um, supports that they need to feel good about um, sending their students to school should they choose to um, um, move forward with in-person services. And then I think why this one can be for you. I know we talked a little bit about our ventilation processes and um, HVAC and our plan to put individual things in classrooms that may not be meeting a certain standard, but can you just give another little update about that? Uh, that's a, that seems to be the hot question here. Um, so um, again, I think this, the real serious thing to, for folks to know um, out there is uh, we're going through all the guidance from the Departments of Health and the CDC. We go through every single classroom. Um, in fact, we are going to have each school have its own. Uh, we already have safety plans for each school now, and then we're adding on additional details for uh, the things that I was mentioning of how you're entering and exiting, how the classroom is going to be set up, and then we're going to go through and do an oversight or audit to make sure that we are authorizing schools that they're truly ready to follow all those guidelines which is going to also include um, the HVAC. So making sure what's the airflow, what is what is that in conjunction to actually other classrooms and other spaces in that area? Because even if you, uh, for HVAC, they may have a shared ventilation system for a particular area of a building. And so we want to make sure that we are understanding about what that airflow is for those uh, shared spaces. 
And then in the event that there was a positive case, then we can most certainly do their case tracking uh, for any of those environments that we think so. So again, we're trying to minimize uh, the transmission of it and really understand where flow is, uh, not only for airflow, but traffic flow as well. Okay, that's great. And I know there's also been questions, Dr. Codd, about um, the involvement of our labor partners throughout this process. And I know that we had a lot of different entry points, you know, engagement process. We had a lot of meetings set up. I talked a little bit about the, at the beginning about the health um, and safety team. So do you want to just talk a little bit about how our labor partners have been engaged thus far? Sure, uh, I will certainly try. So um, as you probably know, we don't really communicate directly with members of Seattle Education Association. We have a labor management structure where the district leadership communicates with the Seattle Education Association leadership. And that's how we formally communicate back and forth when it has um, anything to do with negotiations around um, a variety of topics and certainly the reopening of schools. So SEA has been involved since June um, and even before on leadership teams engaged in conversations about reopening, sort of the pros and the cons, looking at the data. They've uh, been at the table with other leaders from other labor partners and from with community members. As soon as we knew that the school board had voted on this resolution for a return to in-person for pre-K through first grade and intensive and uh, modern to intensive service pathways, uh, we immediately reached out to the Seattle Education Association moments after the board vote and started to engage in that conversation about needing to negotiate and come to the table in good faith. So we have been talking with SEA since then. We have been working back and forth at the leadership level to talk about that timeline. So we are not waiting to bargain. It's just that there is a, a sequence to bargaining that involves leadership discussions before the big uh, sort of bargaining groups come together at the table. And so we are in those preparations. We are in those conversations. We have been there all along the way. Um, and that's kind of how the structure works. Great, thank you for that. Um, I guess time always flies so quickly, but. Um, why, if maybe you can just tell us why March 1st and not sooner? Uh, well, that's a, um, it's an incredible lift to prepare uh, 70 school sites. Uh, so that's our elementary and K-8 schools. Uh, just as you were mentioning earlier, the survey, getting that information out and getting feedback from staff is the first huge step that we have in place. Uh, once we can figure out the number of families uh, that want to send their student in in-person services. It triggers uh, a lot of work for my colleagues here to really understand, all right, that many students. OK, we know that we can't fit more than 15 students in a classroom safely. We know that we were going out and surveying staff who can come and provide in-person services um, and then uh, making sure then we're joining them up and having the, the classroom set up. Um, and then I, did I ever mention that the fact that uh, bus drivers just haven't been sitting around? Um, so uh, we've been trying to retain the bus drivers with the services in our contract, uh, but you know we got to make sure we get them back, get everybody trained up, making sure everybody's ready, orient our families, uh, get all this uh, the lines set up, literally tape on floors, uh, and then we're ready to go. Um, and so one thing I've learned about COVID um, in this case of operating across 104 schools, they said. Uh, we go, we do diligently and work hard every day, uh, but we want to make sure that we're upholding the health and safety protocols because we want to make sure that we secure the trust um, that we have with our families and our students um, because that way uh, we can continue to educate our students um, and so we don't lose time, uh, most certainly any more time than we've already uh, lost due to this pandemic. So. Yeah, thank you. And this is, I mean, there, there are teams working behind the scenes constantly. And as I said at the beginning, there's been this planning has been happening um, for a return to school since we actually had to close our buildings. And so just want to thank this team on here. A um, lot of questions. I appreciate everybody putting those questions in. Again, I would suggest if you join Tardy to this that you can go back to the beginning. There's a lot of good information at the beginning about the work that's gone in. Um, continue to check our frequently asked questions page. 
there'll be a lot of information. We'll collect all the questions that are coming in on this as well. It's always very helpful um, to that. We will continue, to, we'll do these more frequently as well so that we are keeping everybody up to date on the happenings um, as we look towards March 1st return to school. There have been some questions about, um, you know, I did write a letter to the governor and our public health officials about trying to get um, our educators and our school-based staff, our custodians, our school nutrition staff workers, security, you know, everybody who plays a role that uh, has been showing up in buildings, our school leaders um, vaccinated as soon as possible. We'd love to get that going because we know that will boost the confidence of everybody within this pandemic um, of, of our return to school. And so, yes, if you would like to advocate, I think that's a great role for our families and even our staff to play of let's get them on the list, let's get our educators prioritized and let's get them vaccinated um, so as we roll back into our March 1st in person. I have not heard back, but I also know that um, some of our Washington legislators who uh, serve on, who are the leaders of the education committees down in Olympia also wrote a letter asking that our educators be prioritized across the state. So that's currently where we are. You've heard a lot of information today. Again, check out Frequently Asked Questions. Thank you for joining us and we will be back soon. Appreciate this team. Thanks.